All right. Well, thank you. And for those that have joined in now or those that will join in later, I just uh, appreciate being here and having a, a chance to really break up your day or your week a little bit. I think all of us need a little bit of a distraction at this point. So um, we'll talk about something other than coronavirus today, which probably is a relief to most people since that's all we are talking about these days, it seems like. Someone that I was talking to the other day said, won't it be nice when we'll have something to talk about, you know, we can go get a drink and, and not talk about coronavirus. Um, so today will be a little bit of a respite. Um, we'll talk about AI and the future of generosity. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, we're doing quite a bit of consulting on uh, coronavirus and more in line with raising money um, during a time of crisis. And uh, some of that does relate to AI and technology. So happy to answer any questions. But um, we'll get, just introduce myself really quick. I have a slide here, just a high level about me. Um, uh, so my name is Nathan Chappelle. I am the president of a company called Futurist Group. Um, so uh, after about 20 years in the nonprofit sector, actually just 20 years in the nonprofit sector, I uh, left my position as senior vice president at City of Hope and I uh, went to the dark side and uh, work for a private company that only works in the nonprofit sector. So I still very much align myself as uh, one of you, um, always will, always have, um, and uh, care deeply about the philanthropic sector uh, and what it means for society and for humanity and, um, and actually to just the outpouring of generosity during this time of crisis has been really kind of some of the reasons why I think a lot of us work in this field and uh, find such joy and uh, pride in, in what we do, um, working for a greater good versus just uh, you know selling widgets or you know, working to make other people rich. So um, uh, like I said, 20 years in fundraising, I had uh, actually worked in human services, I worked in religion, uh, I have worked in, uh, I was an assistant vice chancellor at UC San Diego where I was over campaign and operations. Uh, and I was just, as I mentioned, senior vice president at City of Hope. Um, and uh, so I have a lot of experience. Uh, I've been considered more of the jack of all trades for whatever reason. Um, I'm typically given jobs that nobody else wants. And uh, I somehow am a glutton for punishment and just say yes, and you know, I like to learn new things, and it's just been a career of learning new things. Uh, it's been really great. Um, in addition to that, I had actually been a consultant with CCS, and, um, and now I do a lot of consulting along with our work in AI and in philanthropy, uh, helping organizations really maximize productivity and uh, with a focus on using business intelligence as a way to uh, build strategy and um, increase results. So. Uh, we'll jump in here just a little, uh, in a, uh, we'll just jump right in, I guess. Um, and again, this is all disorienting for me a little bit because I'm used to seeing other people, but I just see myself and I, I think people are out there in the in the world listening. So um, thanks for, for being there and um, adapting, you know, with me and with us. Uh, one of the things that I usually start this presentation with is this quote, uh, if you don't like change, you're going to like irrelevance even less. And even though I have other presentations that talk about uh, this moment in time in philanthropy and why this is so important now more than ever, the reality is there is a massive amount of change in our field. Um, it is just the tip of the iceberg. The private sector has gone through this change um, really over the last 10 years. The nonprofit sector is just barely at the cusp of what will become a new way of doing business. And uh, we saw this firsthand a few years ago when we started working in AI um, at, while I was at City of Hope. And uh, we're seeing more and more now. Um, but in reality, um, people in the nonprofit sector are still very fearful of AI. Um, but I think 51% of nonprofit executives are fearful of, of what AI is. Uh, thinks or needs, think they need to have an ethical framework about how to use AI, which I totally agree with. Um, but this is uncharted territory for our field, which typically runs 10, 15, 20 years, depends on who you ask, behind the private sector. But with that said, as the private sector advances um, in using AI in almost every facet of business, the need for the nonprofit sector to stay on par, to adopt new technology, and to remain relevant um, as 
as measured in dollars and also participation will never be more important. So let's, uh, this presentation is um, built to be kind of a layperson's um, high level overview about what AI is, where it came from, how it's being used in the private sector, how it's being used in the nonprofit sector, and then some uh, conversation around what to think about and do um, if you want to explore AI um, and who to talk to and, and uh, resources that you can go to. So it's meant to be pretty practical um, at the same time, uh, provide a pretty good baseline of like how, where we're at today. So feel free to ask any questions in chat and I'm happy to answer any of those. So um, going back to the question of what is AI anyway, uh, most people have seen the movie Imitation Game, um, and it's around the story of Alan Turing. But basically, AI has been around since around 1955. But around 1950, Alan Turing uh, was creating, you know, the machine to um, break the the German code. And and what's not only important about it advances in the technology of a machine that could basically adapt or somewhat pivot on a daily basis to changing code was that Alan Turing published a paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. And it's that work that he had developed um, and had just incredible insight in that one day a machine would be basically be able to exhibit human behavior that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a machine and, and a human. And this paper was basically coined the Turing test. And the Turing test, what's interesting about this, is still used today. It's still basically the, uh, the, the um, kind of basis of when society uh, develops a computer that will mimic a human so well that a human standing in front of the computer doesn't know that it's a computer, it will have been said to pass the Turing test. And uh, that will be a uh, defining moment in civilization. There's a lot of debate on how far away that is um, as early as 10 years from now to um, a lot of data scientists. They actually pull data scientists every year on this topic. Um, and I think the consensus is about 50% of data scientists believe that it's about 30 years away. Uh, some believe that it will never happen um, and others believe that it's as close as, you know, in the next few years. Talk a little bit more about that um, in the uh, in, throughout the slides, but it's a very relevant topic, and it's pretty much where probably every sci-fi movie gone bad starts. Um, when a computer passes the Turing test, it it almost is where all hell breaks loose, and you know robots are running down the street with weapons. Um, so it is an important topic, um, and it's important to understand um, where we're at in the continuum of that. Um, it, as of today, our AI is. Ex extremely far away from being able to pass the Turing test. Um, it is limited to things that we ask it to do, um, but in my opinion is probably at the exponential rate that computing is going and advancements in quantum computing is that it is possible in our lifetime, um, but I, I probably think it's about 15, 20 years away personally. The real uh, term artificial intelligence was coined by this person, John McCarthy, Lots and lots of people and a lot of debate on whether, you know, uh, basically the UK and Turing should be um, um, granted kind of the, the rights to have created the term. But really it was this, this person, John McCarthy, who coined the term, um, written in a proposal that he had actually uh, written to the Rockefeller Foundation to gather a group of scientists at Dartmouth to study um, this thing that he was calling artificial intelligence. So that goes back to 1955. He was at MIT for a short period of time and then spent a majority of his career at Stanford. Um, and it can be argued that John McCarthy is a big reason why Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley, uh, is that his work for a long period of time as this you know amazing thought leader in the space up at Stanford was really what drew um, eventually so many people to that area um, to what is really, I think, arguably the probably most advanced um, geographic area, I think, outside of, you know, kind of in combination with Boston, probably, um, in the world in terms of advancements in AI. Uh, but this is a paper I was referring to, and it's just funny to look back um, at the fact that, that um, philanthropy as a whole was really the impetus or what, what, what helped initiate the exploration of AI. 
So the Rockefeller Foundation uh, was given this proposal in 1955, lots of correspondence back and forth. Former colleague of mine, uh, Nathan Fay from City of Hope, had actually uh, uncovered all the correspondence from uh, Rockefeller Foundation back and forth, and uh, it's just so interesting to read that and um, hear how the, basically the Rockefeller Foundation came back and said, this is really interesting uh, information, except that you know we think it's pretty far out there, so we're not going to give you the full amount, but we'll give you half. And uh, we joke, but we don't joke, is that anyone who's in foundation fundraising knows that foundations really haven't changed since 1955 and how they tend to fund risky propositions. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how things have stayed the same from that perspective. Uh, in the, uh, uh, from that high level perspective, really, the, the AI is an extremely broad term. It actually is a very generic term that um, if you're speaking with a data scientist, they'll almost scoff at you for using the term AI. I typically don't use the word AI or artificial intelligence with anyone that's in the sector um, that's a, a chief information security officer or a CTO. Um, you, you, they tend to immediately think that you don't know what you're talking about. So the, one of the most uh, probably important things to realize when you're talking about AI, AI captures in a massive array of different uh, computing technology that is focused on uh, replicating human behavior or enhancing uh, things that a human would do, um, but doing that in a way that would be more efficient, uh, that a computer could do it much faster. But the three kind of basic areas that most AI is referred to are these three, machine learning, uh, often called ML, natural language processing, it's often called NLP, and then robotics. And robotics often actually use um, a, a big portion of ML and sometimes NLP. Um, so they're kind of a combination, of course, um, machine learning. Uh, and when you actually look at Google search terms, machine learning is actually searched more um, as a term than artificial intelligence as a whole. So people um, recently, in the last two, three years, are getting more familiar with this term, um, or at least searching for information about this term more often than they are the terms AI. Uh, but really, machine learning is the computing statistical analysis that goes um, into a machine that uh, becomes extremely nuanced and can use unlimited amounts of data, frankly. Um, it is very similar to um, old statistical analysis, except that the machine actually learns over time. As the machine gets more data, its predictions get better. As it continues to refine its predictions, it's got this exponential effect. And we've seen this firsthand with clients that we put a machine learning application into, um, into the wild and the machine will predict with accuracy of, say, 50% when we, we release it into the wild. A year and a half later, we just had one of our clients hit 70, uh, 76% accuracy. So machine literally is able to learn uh, from uh, new data that it's being introduced to. Natural language processing, most people understand as being uh, Alexa or Siri or um, your car where you're speaking to it, uh, maps and uh, voice assistants. Uh, natural language processing has been around for a very long time. If you think about um, the days, the uh, days, I guess maybe not that long ago, but it feels like it, where you would call AT and T and and you would say, you know, who do you want to talk to or what's your issue, and you would you, eventually it would be so poor in understanding what you were doing that you just hit zero 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 zero, and that is so different now than it has been before, and frankly, I've finally come to the conclusion occasionally that it's easier to talk to a computer than it is to a person, um, which is a massive advancements in uh, natural language processing, uh, but still a small sector, a subset of AI uh, work. So natural language processing is, is roots in both a computer understanding uh, your human language and interpreting that into some sort of instruction or the opposite of a computer actually taking some instruction and vocalizing it to you. So both
uh, where there are no windows. He works uh, like 10 hours. Hey, Nathan. Hey, Nathan. Days. Just for a second there, people lost sound. So if you just want to backtrack about 15 okay. seconds, that'd be helpful. Okay. Uh, back to natural language processing? Yeah, about 10 seconds ago or so. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and I'm hired, hardwired into the phone here, but we'll, uh, if, let me know if that continues. So, um, so natural language processing really is something that everyone uses every day. It's, uh, it's even though it's a small subsect, uh, subsector of AI, it's something that you interface with. It makes life easier. Um, it's easy to ask your phone, you know, what's the weather going to be like today? Or, um, you know, have the, have your car tell you, you know, voice directions on how to get somewhere. Um, and just to be clear, natural language processing uses a heavy dose of machine learning um, when it's actually continuing to learn. In fact, Google in the, in the beginning days would have a lot of humans uh, monitor the Google search chats and then feed the computer the right answer. This was done for years and years with thousands and thousands. Now the computer is able to do that much uh, more accurately, accurately on its own. And the more input that the computer gets, the more accurate it will be at, at um, predicting what a person is looking for. Uh, robotics is, uh, I think I might have cut out, but robotics is probably one of the most disruptive from a labor market perspective. Um, it's uh, a friend of mine who works in Amazon, works in a factory uh, distribution center, very like million square foot uh, distribution center, um, and he oversees hundreds of robots. And he goes into a building, works 10 hours a day, four days a week with no windows. Um, and there are hundreds of robots basically gathering um, uh, items and then sending them to the right place so that they could be eventually packaged uh, mostly autonomously um, and then shipped out. It is uh, it, obviously robots don't have back injuries. They can work 24-7. Um, they don't have workers' comp issues. So there's a lot of uh, obviously uh, application for robots in factories. Uh, flight systems have been highly robotic for a long time. And now we're seeing the big, big wave of autonomous vehicles, um, either vehicles that can come pick you up like a Tesla um, in front of your, you know, your in short range or a car that can self-park um, to basically um, trucks and semis that are uh, going uh, route to route to deliver um, cargo. Um, and they're doing this in Arizona. There's autonomous uh, semi-trucks that can go point to point, uh, loaded, and of course, you know, AI, they don't need to take breaks other than, you know, they, as long as their gas tank is full and they have enough gas to get to one place to the other, they're good to go. We're going to see a lot, lot, lot more of that in the near future, so it'll be interesting to see how individuals um, acclimate to that. So the future of AI, like I, I talked about, is highly debated. Um, Andrew Ng, who's uh, most people know through Coursera, and it's actually the most um, watched um, or course taken on Coursera is uh, on the application of AI, um, has, has this quote, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is the new electricity. Um, it is so much intertwined into literally every business facet um, on the planet at this point in places in South Africa or Nigeria that you would never even imagine um, it's everywhere. Um, but the future and where this goes is really much um, up for debate, and it really depends on who you ask. So Jeff Bezos says AI is in the golden age, solving problems that were once the realm of sci-fi. Jeff Bezos, um, if we didn't think that Amazon was an unstoppable force to reckon with before coronavirus, um, after this uh, scenario, it will be insanely, it will be, frankly, in my prediction, like Rockefeller, um, at, at a point where the government may actually break up Amazon. And then if Jeff Bezos wasn't rich enough, he'll become really, really rich after that happens, like Rockefeller did. But um, Amazon is really a front leader in investing in technology since the very beginning. Um, when no one thought this would actually work, when people wouldn't even put their credit card in to buy a book because they were afraid their credit card would be stolen, uh, to continue to reinvest and reinvest and reinvest. Uh, Amazon, of course, delivers products, and they're very good at predicting things that you they think you need that you didn't know you need, but now all of a sudden you, you realize you need them, um, which is annoyingly annoying but also helpful sometimes. Um, to basically managing a vast, probably, of the, the main competitors, Google and Microsoft, and Amazon host 
the vast, vast majority of AI applications um, in the private sector around the world and the nonprofit sector. Um, so their, their hosting capabilities and their serving server warehouses that are all over the world now um, are really the backbone of what is going on in AI, affordable AI in the country. They are also a reason why uh, for us even, or in the nonprofit sector, um, organizations can start thinking about AI affordably. It's not just those that own a supercomputer. You can basically lease space on an Amazon server, which is what their entire business, uh, which is called AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, is built on. You know, so Elon Musk has been an interesting person to watch. He has completely changed his tune um, over the past two years, really, around uh, his view on AI. Really, in the beginning, it was uh, AI is our greatest existential threat. Even though that's um, similar to how he still believes, his theory of how to um, counter that is very different than it was a few years ago. Um, he used to do a lot of public speaking about uh, privacy and ethics and things like that and the fear of AI. And he, um, uh, if you're following him, he's just a fascinating individual to watch. He actually might be part AI already. Um, he is actually wanting to become part AI and, and wants society to. So he has uh, uh, jumped into open AI and with this um, uh, idea product called neural lacing where the only way that we don't succumb to computers in the future that we were talking about this uh, this point where uh, computer passes the Turing test it's it's actually called uh, singularity and when that happens um, computers will find humans are irrelevant and uh, and one example of this would be if you asked a supreme AI machine uh, how do you stop global warming, it would quickly decide that humans are the issue around global warming and the best uh, thing to do would be to eliminate humans. Um, Elon and uh, a group of extremely brilliant people are struggling with these questions. Um, Elon's take on this is that to uh, the next evolution of the human race is to be part human and part computer. The way that he's thought about this is to have a, a microchip or some computer implant um, blended into your, your brain to enhance cognitive ability. This is happening right now. It's Whether you think it's scary or not, these conversations are happening on a daily. Uh, millions and millions of dollars are going into research on these things. It will likely start showing up in, uh, it already is, in um, um, individuals that are, say, paraplegic or have other uh, disabilities um, and to test the efficacy of these theories, and then it will move out into the general population. My concern with this uh, um, on a, a global scale, obviously, is that the disparity of wealth and non-wealth will become greater and greater as individuals, um, well, some individuals of means will have the ability to outperform a traditional human being um, by a factor of hundred, hundreds. It would just be in, insane. So it will be really interesting. Um, Bill Gates has taken a, a kind of a different approach. In fact, he said, I don't agree with Elon Musk. We shouldn't panic about it. He is really in that mindset of AI is still very far away. Frankly, it's um, not to use, uh, these are not his terms, but stupid AI in that AI only does exactly what we program it to do and it can it really can't think on its own. It can only solve problems in very finite, specific areas. And so it's interesting to watch these leaders um, and their different take on it and how active they are um, in this conversation. And then lastly, this is a new addition to this presentation, but um, I thought I'd throw this in there in case you haven't seen it. But um, even, you know, our, our beloved Iron Man is getting into this conversation, which is interesting to watch him as a, uh, a host and not a an actor. But there's a YouTube series, The Age of AI, um, and I, I actually I can't remember. I think there are ten uh, in the series, but they are going into the practical application of AI and what's going on today um, in prosthetics, in uh, hearing, in um, sports, and auto racing. Uh, if you're, I assume since you're either listening to this live or will listen to it later that you're interested in AI, uh, probably the most, the best condensed version of a kind of a lay audience 
view of AI is within these YouTube uh, original series, and they're all free. Um, they're fairly short, but they are real people, uh, real scientists, the, the foremost experts in the world talking about this. Um, and then Robert Downing Jr. is really getting into this idea around AI being able to help um, with uh, global uh, climate change. So it started a foundation is really a focus on how AI can help uh, clean up the planet and reverse the effects that we've gotten global warming. So in the private sector, as I've already mentioned a few, um, it, it literally, is, you, you can't even throw a stone without hitting a company that's using AI. Uh, some of the, the these big ones, of course, Amazon, Netflix, and Facebook, they've been using AI for a really long time. You know, it was a big deal when IBM Watson, you know, beat uh, someone at chess and then at someone at Go. I mean, that's old hat, and it's not even that long ago. The advances in AI in the last several years um, are exponential, and the availability of cheap AI for even small businesses are um, remarkable. And I was talking to a friend yesterday. Um, it will be interesting to see the effect since a vast majority of Wall Street um, and stock pricing and, and purchasing and selling is done through AI at this point, not uh, individual traders, is that the stock market decline um, in the last you know couple of weeks, was it um, as bad as it was because AI does not know how to deal with anomalies um, because it has no pandemic to base its conclusions on? Or was it better than it would have been if humans were reacting because there would have been an even bigger sell-off, but the AI could look further ahead? So these are interesting conversations that you have to think about and talk about. I don't know the answer to that question yet, but we will find out um, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, my prediction is actually the, the, um, the sell-off would have been worse um, had AI not been, frankly, quote-unquote, in control. If you look at the sell-off in 2008, although that was obviously a, a, a flaw in the banking system, um, I think AI played a big part in this one um, and actually is playing a part in the rebound as well and looking further out into the future. So the reality is for small, medium, large businesses, this, this is literally the, the stark reality, is that winners take all. And for the nonprofit sector, it's no different. Why companies that wait to adopt AI may never catch up is something that we see every day. Um, it's not taken as seriously in the nonprofit sector as it should be, but in the private sector, it's an arms race for business intelligence. And the reality is there is a giant sucking sound of data scientists um, that every university that's graduating uh, computer scientists, it's amazing what an undergrad student, uh, my son is actually a junior studying computer science in college right now, and the starting salaries um, of a student graduating um, immediately in the work that they'll be doing. So the real issue is that the private sector is, is hiring um, individuals, and if you think about anyone that works in gaming or analytics, um, they're making a very good living um, they're working hard, um, but they are um, taking a lot of that talent out of the market, out of the nonprofit market. So this has never been more true than in the nonprofit sector is that if you wait, um, you may not find the talent that you're looking for. The other difference with AI, because like I said, it has this machine learning exponential effect of getting better and better over time, is that if you start today, even though you don't feel like you're ready, that you will be that much further ahead that, than someone that starts in a year. So like I said, with one of our clients who started out with 50% accuracy in an AI model 18 months ago to 76% today, they are that much further ahead of any of their competitors that are still waiting to do a CRM implementation or clean up their data. Um, there is really no, um, uh, uh, no benefit to waiting to deploy AI. AI is extremely forgiving in um, adding new data and working with the data along the way. Um, the biggest risk for organizations is waiting too long, and then, frankly, your competitors that will have been um, what would be considered early adopters, I guess I use that loosely in nonprofit sector because um, there's really nothing in the nonprofit sector that I would really consider early adopters. The technology has been around for years, but um, early adopters in the nonprofit sector were, are going to eat everyone's lunch that um, have waited to deploy technology. 
So, like I said, most um, Americans, 85% of Americans already use are using AI. There's a big question of whether or not they um, know it, and there's an even bigger question on um, on the data privacy, which is really at the forefront of a lot of people's minds at this point. Um, most people, a uh, vast majority of people, don't feel like they have any control over their data privacy. Um, and while Facebook now gives you some options to uh, turn off certain things, the new privacy guidelines that came out in January basically uh, showed if you've read Instagram or, or Facebook or um, WhatsApp's uh, privacy guidelines, is that they track everything on your phone. If you've ever had any of the Facebook apps ever installed on your phone, uh, you don't even have to have them installed today, but they will track everything on your phone, even when your phone is off. Um, you can now turn those privacy settings off, um, which I've actually done, uh, but it's not that easy. You have to Google it and ha figure out how to do it. Interestingly enough, Google has not given users the same rights, but they are tracking everything on your phone, uh, as well as Apple when it's on and off. Apple's been much better about keeping that data private. Uh, the reason why Facebook, in fact, does not feel like they have to comply with the California uh, Consumer Perf uh, Privacy Act, which dictates um, companies to let them to let everyone know what data you're keeping, because it they claim that they're not selling their data to anyone. And the only loophole in that is that they only just buy a new company, and instead of selling your data to that new company, they buy the new company and they give you the they give them the data. So it's uh, highly contested, and it will be in courts for a long time. So um, just in talk, uh, talk about scale and how big this thing is, um, AI is everywhere. Um, AI grew 270% in the last four years. Um, Chatbots, like I was talking about, natural language processing will power 85% of customer service by the end of this year. We're seeing it everywhere. And the three in, uh, most in-demand skills on monster.com are machine learning, deep learning, and natural language processing. So massive shift. Nonprofit sector has not kept up with that shift. Uh, but needs to. Uh, this, and, and I'm happy to send this deck to anybody who wants any of these slides or links to any of these studies. Um, you can send me an email. I think I have my email at the end of this, but I'm happy to, to share this deck with anyone. Uh, but 81% of adult, U.S. adults believe they have little or no control over their personal data. This is something that um, I think is even more paramount in the nonprofit sector. Myself and a friend of mine, Jared Sheehan, are leading an online discussion with the Nonprofit Alliance on data ethics and uh, working to help create a framework for um, ethics and data in the nonprofit sector before wide-scale AI is um, deployed in the nonprofit sector. And of course, my fear is that if there is a Cambridge Analytica-esque um, misuse of data in the nonprofit sector, it will decimate the the uh, nonprofit industry's reputation. So talk just for a second about a shift in jobs, and I've had conversations with former colleagues about this, um, but anywhere from 75 million to 375 million people are going to need to switch occupations in the next 10 years. And um, while in the nonprofit sector there are um, a lot of jobs focused on the art of fundraising, the the need to be empathetic and observant and relate, relatable and relation, you know, build relationships um, and be, you know, build trusting relationships. That will, I frankly, I don't think will really ever change. But some of the back office jobs um, will be automated, and some of the things that we used to have uh, teams and teams of research um, uh, researchers on fundraising teams, we've seen that dwindle. Uh, because data is more accessible and more uh, more accurate, it's in more real time. So um, Kai Fu Li, who wrote a book uh, called AI Superpowers, he is he ran Google China. He um, has been on Dateline and 60 Minutes. This is straight from his book with one ex one uh, edition. I added the word fundraiser in the top right quadrant, but this basically just shows his philosophy which is pretty much a, a, a commonly accepted philosophy at this point, that AI will be um, dis determined, the use of AI will be determined on the axis of compassion and, and creativity or strategy. So if you go up and then to the right, the upper right-hand right quadrant is really where um, jobs were gonna be safe, uh, where compassion is needed and either creative uh, creativity or strategy, 
I took the liberty of adding fundraiser in there because really fundraiser is very much like a religious leader um, or a concierge or a social worker. Um, some days feels more like that than others. Um, is that in that quadrant, um, you have to have very, uh, not only just human skills, you've refined human skills to be effective in those jobs. The, the jobs that use, usually surprise people that will eventually go away um, are in the bottom right and the bottom left. And, and those are, are jobs where you would think, uh, we've seen radiology um, uh, even a year to two years ago saying, well, now we need, a, you know, AI is good and it can help a radiologist be better at their job. And now it's like, well, let AI drive, and now a radiolo radiologist just validates what the AI is doing. So it's changing all the time. Truck driver is another one that I, I just talked about. Um, and then over on the right side, things that you wouldn't think would be in here, like a, a economist, which AI is extremely good. Um, like I said, it actually getting away from a lot of uh, personal biases and just looking at facts in the future. Uh, but columnist, and columnist is one that um, there are so many um, um, articles now written on the internet from Huffington Post or others that are actually written by AI and then validated by a human. And you don't realize it, but as soon as uh, 100 or so articles come out about any given topic, AI can instantly read all of those articles and then using natural language processing, rewrite the article to look like original content and then basically just have a, uh, a person uh, validate it for you know some certain things and validity and then push it out. Uh, one of the questions um, uh, for me to repeat the name of the book, the book is called AI Superpowers. Um, it's on Amazon, of course. It's written by a gentleman, Kai-Fu Lee. It's one of my favorite books. It really has to, uh, on AI, it has um, a lot to do with the arms race of AI between China and the US. And a lot of it has to do with cultural differences and work ethic. Um, and some ego um, where that the U.S. has where China um, can replicate and go faster than the U.S. So it's uh, really an arms race, uh, but great book, and it will lead you to a bunch of other books as well. This is how it, uh, Kai-Fu Lee basically says it will play out. Um, the, the ones on the, the bottom right, like columnists that I talked about, are going to be AI-driven plus a human. Uh, those on the left, like the radiologist and the truck driver, can eventually will be predicted to go straight to all AI. So those are jobs that either need to be um, relearned, that they need to be either, either retooled to learn how to run the AI or to um, uh, program AI, monitor AI. Uh, right now, in fact, there's truck drivers that sit in a semi-truck with the AI as the truck is driving itself. So to prove that it can do this safely and effectively. Um, so those are examples of basically how this moves from AI to human to just AI by itself eventually. And Nathan, I think you so, said this, but can you, uh, someone asked in a question here, what is the name of the book that this is from? Yeah, I'm sorry. It's called AI Superpowers by Kai-Fu Lee. So i um, happy to send a link. In fact, in this deck, I have a link to the book, I believe, in the very end um, as well. And so I can send you all those links. Um, so in terms of um, why this even matters, the, the reality is that most organizations, nonprofits, and I have the benefit of working with a few hundred nonprofits now, um, really feel like it's getting harder to raise the same amount of money, um, whether it's increased competition or people are giving less. I have a lot of theories on it. I'll cover a couple. But the, the reality is to survive, not even thrive, but to survive, you know, in the near future, in the nonprofit sector will be to leverage data in a way that has never been leveraged. It, data will need to be used to um, not only monitor activity, but help you determine strategy. That's something that our, our sector has a hard time with. Um, but as we know, giving you know, continues to look like it's 2.1% of GDP. Um, while it, it looks like it's a big number and the number goes up, although this year I've got other predictions for how things will play out. Um, but but in, in all, you know, it looks like, well, Flansby is growing. But in the reality, giving in the US is down um, among individuals um, and the reason for that is the, the big 427 billion number is that ultra high net worth individuals are giving massive amounts of, of money 
which is basically masking giving by individuals um, that are actually giving less. So if we look at a trajectory, and I think I have a slide in here, but it shows that really for about 40 years, uh, philanthropy is, is centered around 2.1% of GDP. Nothing that has been done is increasing um, how much money is being raised as a percentage of G GDP. People are just not, frankly, being that inspired. Um, and really, when it comes down to it, only 56% of Americans actually make philanthropic gifts. So the competition and the feeling for nonprofits that it's getting harder to raise the same money um, is true. It, it is absolutely harder to raise the same amount of money, and this uh, kind of philosophy of working smarter, not harder, has never been more important. So we're really facing this shift um, in the United States, and the Europe had actually faced this, faced this shift um, in the past and, and really has come down to, in, in the UK especially, where giving is extremely transactional. There is a, there's a lot of membership organizations, and it, culturally it's good to be part of those membership organizations from a status perspective, but it's a quid pro quo in a, in a transaction. Uh, the U.S. is really going down that road unless we can find a way to engage people um, more effectively. And it's something that I'm calling a generosity crisis, and I'm only calling that because no one is talking about this. Because when Giving USA reports that we had a, a you know gross or a, a, a increase in philanthropy, the number went up, uh, if you will. If you look at the underlying data, um, the average person in America is giving less, and that's a real issue. There's several philosophies on this. One is the tax code changes um, two years ago uh, for the universal itemized deduction, and so interesting because we saw a dip in individual giving uh, for the first time. Um, in many years. Uh, a lot of people said it was because of the tax code changes. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the um, kind of st stimulus, the COVID stimulus uh, pieces of the, uh, uh, of the uh, $2 trillion was to provide a universal deduction again to enact this in short term that every single person can write off $300 without having to itemize on their taxes. Um, it shows to me that, that Washington is aware of the uh, the flaw in going back to you know going back to a few years ago, and only allowing the deductions for those that itemize. So uh, I'm hoping that sticks, but that's one of the issues. The other issue is religion, and I won't talk about this very long. But uh, I uncovered this uh, statistic in a report that the average American that associates themselves with any religion gives twice as much as someone who does not. And it uh, doesn't matter what religion, but if you're associated with any religion, you give twice as much as someone who doesn't. Um, when you think about it, religion basically accounts for 30% of all giving to religion. It actually is influencing 60% of all giving. And it's a pretty startling fact when you couple that with the fact that um, the average uh, American, well, there's a disassociation, disassociation with religion about 7% per year. So less people basically are, are I guess, learning the, uh, the values of giving back. And so um, it's, uh, that's where I really, talking about the generosity crisis, and, and I'm hoping someone will write a book on this, and I'd love to provide insight into it eventually. But it, um, it is something that is a, some major trends in our, in our society that are um, challenging philanthropy. And this is the, the graph or the data I was talking about earlier. But no matter how you slice it, and really I looked at um, the birth of the internet, the commercialization of the internet around 98, um, it basically only increased philanthropy about two tenths of 1%, but then it flattened. Um, so while we made it easier for people to give, we gave them new technology or tools, uh, the actual giving has not increased. So, and, and, and we can make it as easy as possible, but the reality is if people are not engaged, they're not going to give. Um, this is basically just honing in on that little um, space and time is that you would think that all of a sudden we could give people this tool to give very quickly um, is that, you know, you can give from your phone now that it would increase giving and it has not. It really comes down to how people resonate with an organization not and whether or not they're frankly trained um, from a, a young, you know, from a young age on the virtues of giving. And that's something that 
some area needs to really take account for, not just religion, but any other area that um, really understands the value of giving back. Um, and also the values of giving back either through volunteerism or through monetary. Uh, when you look at surveys of millennials, they'll actually value the um, volunteerism as the same dollar value as um, as giving actual dollars, whereas you uh, survey other generations, X or um, boomers, they will actually um, not value them the same. They'll value the dollars above the volunteerism. So major shifts in giving in the U.S., which is why we frankly, from to keep things um, going, um, at least to not lose traction, but in my um, dream world, we would actually inspire a net increase in giving, something new has to happen. Um, I talked about this. This actually graph is, um, shows the decline uh, or the disassociation of religion, the unaffiliated. So you can see that number is going up about 7% a year of, of individuals that are disassociating with religion, meaning that um, it, it really uh, the religious part being irrelevant for this conversation, um, it really has to do with the understanding of the virtues of giving um, and that, that more people are not really learning that at a, whatever age um, or place in their life. Um, but the good part is, and while that seems kind of doom and gloom, the, the convergence of all of that happening all at the same time is that there is new technology, and new um, um, data and tools available that have never been available that really um, don't have to, that, that makes this not have to be a doom and gloom scenario, that this can be, frankly, an opportunity to reverse trends, to use AI in a way that's um, inspiring, connecting people to causes they care about, um, inspiring them to give. And um, I think many people who know me know that I did a TED Talk a few years ago, a TEDx on this, and it was really um, looking at how the, the main reasons of why uh, people are not giving, it's frankly all comes down to um, their understanding, either even knowing about a nonprofit and, and a nonprofit and how it aligns with their values and how they resonate with the mission and how they want to be identified with it. So in this world of mass data and, um, and mass communication and so much information, it's overwhelming. The, the technology needs to be pointed in a direction to help identify individuals that have a passion towards something um, unique and allowing that nonprofit to find, find those individuals like a needle in the haystack and say, this person identifies with our core mission and we can develop um, a relationship with them that will uh, stand the test of time. So. Uh, I won't go deep into this, but uh, again, Nathan Fay, who I worked with at City of Hope, um, had uncovered this. He's a philosophy, has a master's in philosophy, had, um, came up, uh, discovered this quote from Aristotle, which I thought was so interesting at the time because we think of these issues as new issues um, that we're like, you know, all of a sudden it's like now our problem and we, you know, things are different for us than they've ever been. But he discovered this, this, uh, quote by Aristotle that was, I think, from 340 BC that says, to give away money is an easy matter in anyone's power, but to decide whom to give it to and how large and when, for what purpose and how to give it is neither in everyone's individual's power nor is it an easy matter. And I think it's so fascinating because 340 BC, you know, 2,000 years ago, um, the exact same issues that we're facing now were occurring. Um, and is so articulate about identifying this. And, and the idea, the reason why I don't think what the difference now and why I don't think it's doom and gloom is that for the first time in history, there's technology that can help answer those questions. Um, if for the last you know, 2,000 plus years, we've not had the data or the technology to be able to address those questions. And if we are able to tick them off one by one, we can expect and we should expect a net increase in uh, in charitable giving. So the exciting part is that maybe two years ago when I started doing this pre presentation a lot more, especially even a year ago, um, there were not a lot of examples of, of using AI in the in the nonprofit sector. There's a lot of theory, uh, a lot of homegrown AI, uh, different people are exploring different things, but I'll share a couple of examples now that are happening today 
um, and it's really exciting because they're, it's, it's becoming uh, more exponential, more of a snowball effect in that um, organizations are trying creative new things. So uh, examples of just in, in high level are like identifying gratitude, which is what we do. So we're able to predict uh, people who are likely to give based on their experience. We don't use wealth data. Um, in that, we, we use wealth data to, to help determine how much someone might give, but we actually don't include that in our algorithm because people give based on experience. Um, uh, curate personalized engagement. Uh, we're seeing uh, different companies come out that are helping you do that, that it, you know, your messaging can be targeted to a specific individual based on how they communicate. Um, automate personalized stewardship. Uh, blockchain I won't get into, it'd be a whole another uh, hour-long conversation for next year, but I do think there's huge application in blockchain um, in financial stewardship for organizations in the future. Um, but determining that how much to ask for, the best approach, the best time, um, all those types of things are things that are happening now in addition to um, different areas of AI that are being used for um, different populations. So. Um, like I said, a friend, a friend of mine, Jared Sheehan, helped uh, co-write this uh, paper uh, a couple months ago, which is uh, the most comprehensive by far uh, paper in uh, the nonprofit sector on the state of AI, uh, extremely detailed. Um, but really, you know, this paper talks about where are we at today, and really the reality is only about 10% of nonprofits are, are using AI at this point, so we're just not even at the beginning of the adoption curve. Uh, we've still got probably two to three years to go, uh, hopefully sooner, but um, there's still a lot of hesitancy. 73% um, believe that it um, could align with their beliefs, and 83% think that there needs to be an ethical framework, which is why we ended up launching um, our discussion with the Nonprofit Alliance on uh, the ethics, the data ethics uh, part of it. But a year and a half ago, you would have not seen this. So McKinsey uh, put out their, this Global Institute analysis of uh, use cases of AI in the nonprofit sector. And this is now um, probably about 10 months old, uh, but they had, they had covered about 160 use cases. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, all the different use cases, their religion is not included. Um, and it's uh, exciting for us because we're developing um, two AI algorithms for uh, actually for the Catholic Church uh, for diocese and parishes right now, which is a uh, fascinating use of AI in a sector that you would not think it would be applied. But these are things that are happening now, and, and they're frankly, you can't even keep up with the data because more and more and more, um, really week by week, month by month, there are more use cases in the nonprofit sector. But even uh, Grant Thornton in their report last year said basically the number one recommendation in their entire report for the nonprofit sector was to use AI uh, to transform operations. Um, and these are all things that you would find in the private sector to be all very um, consistent. And in the private sector, you would you, you know, improve decision making, shift personnel efforts, realize cost savings. Nonprofit is a business and uh, Grant Thornton because they pivot on both sides, are able to see that, that the application of AI and nonprofit is paramount, and which is why it was their literal, num, literally number one recommendation. Um, the, the exciting thing for being a nonprofit right now is that all the, frankly, big companies that are doing a lot of AI, um, have, they, they take a hit on the efficacy or the ethics of using AI uh, to drive profit. So in turn, they're trying to create some goodwill by putting a, quite a bit of money out there for nonprofits to to get to deploy pretty creative uh, AI solutions. So Google last year launched its Impact Challenge. In their first year, 2,600 applicants uh, from 119 countries, but 40% were from organizations that had never used AI in the past. And this funding, which is part of a $25 million grant pool, is going to things like climate change and, um, and medicine and all different sectors. Um, and it's really interesting and exciting to see nonprofits be able to um, get quite a bit of money to help them solve problems that, uh, frankly, governments can't do on their own and the nonprofits couldn't do on their own without uh, the seed uh, funding, and a lot of it comes with consulting 
as well as uh, access to servers and data and all those types of things. So Microsoft got on board to do their, their, their play on this is called AI for Good. Um, they have four key areas, which is pretty consistent with kind of how the Gates Foundation works. But uh, they have Earth, Accessibility, Humanitarian Action, and Cultural Heritage. Huge money uh, for nonprofits to access. Um, again, uh, money, consulting, server time, um, whatever you need, there's um, opportunity for nonprofits to leverage some of those things right now. The other thing is, uh, I remember, I think I, when I was Assistant Vice Chancellor at UC San Diego, I remember tracking the first gift given to big data. And it, I was so excited. I talked to the Vice Chancellor at the time, who was also a data nerd, and was like, oh my gosh, the first gift. And it was, you know, it was a pretty big gift, like $50 million or something for big data. And um, now that's become commonplace. Uh, there, you know, this is like the tip of the iceberg in terms of money that's being given to advance AI. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the work or a lot of the philanthropy dollars that is going that is going into nonprofits, a lot of it is uh, in academic medical centers and higher education facilities. Um, a lot of it is focused on the ethics um, or the application of ethical AI, um, either in the organization or in society. So um, it's a pretty interesting change. I think if anyone uh, is listening to this that uh, is raising money for engineering or um, any, you know, kind of of the sciences side of things, uh, this is a huge opportunity. People are finally are paying attention. But this has not happened five years ago. I mean, it's a major, major shift. Uh, one of the best applications I've seen of AI and human um, uh, improving or saving human lives is a company called Zipline uh, that's based in Northern California. But they have now contracts with Rwanda and actually several other uh, countries uh, in developing countries where they actually can deliver blood um, with a drone to a specific area. And what happens is uh, someone uh, uses a cell phone that says that we need a pint of, you know, um, A positive blood, that um, it actually gets put on a drone. The drone is launched with a slingshot. It flies to this remote area that, frankly, a medical care worker couldn't get to or couldn't get to very easily. It delivers the blood with a parachute to the exact location of the clinic. And if, since they've started this, um, Zipline has, in their uh, hub facilities, has not had one quart of blood go to waste, is not expired since they started doing this because they're delivering the exact blood at the exact time that's actually needed um, rather than keeping a lot of inventory and stock in, in a kind of a hub and spoke uh, version. It's a fascinating thing if you want just a, you know, interesting watch a YouTube, type in Zipline, you can see the drones launching and learn more about it. But it's uh, happening, it's been happening for a couple of years now, uh, this goes back to 2014, and um, it's fascinating. We see uh, University of Maryland, I was just there recently, they delivered a kidney with a drone from your rooftop to rooftop. And uh, versus having to, you know, go and, you know, transport by ambulance at the cost, not only the cost of that, but traffic um, in rush hour and, and where every moment uh, is critical for a person's life. Um, this is happening right now today. You've got a huge application of AI in uh, climate change. And this IBM project has just been pretty phenomenal, but um, it's actually helped cut de deadly airborne pollution in Beijing by 20% in a year by monitoring specifically with geo um, with satellites down to which factory um, in which pollutants that are going into the ozone. So a lot more on that in the future for sure. Um, advances that are have been around for a little while but getting better and better. Um, in fact, this one would be an interesting thing what we'll see in the future is um, uh, real-time transcribing. So as I'm speaking right now, you would see the words on the screen and they'd be extremely accurate. Um, this is already happening in teaching and it's all, all of our schools are going to, you know, virtual environments right now um, for the hearing impaired. This is huge. Uh, this is no longer a person typing in my words and trying to get as much right as they can. There's a computer doing this in real time and becoming actually very accessible. I would predict in a year from now, 
that Zoom and WebEx will have this functionality embedded in their um, software, and um, it's already being used, and it's pretty amazing. For the site impaired, um, this application, they have over 200,000 users already, or, or yeah, 7 million tasks, 200,000 users, where someone that is uh, sight impaired can hold up a phone and um, literally go look around them to see what's going on, and the phone will actually describe uh, verbally what is the, the scenery or the scenario. Uh, it's already happening. It's super exciting. Uh, I think it's a really cool application. Um, and then just truly in the nonprofit, one of the, the most fun, just easy examples, I was uh, with the Fred Hutch uh, team a year ago, a year and a half ago, about a year ago. Um, and of course, being up in Seattle, they had um, uh, Alexa uh, obviously be able to take donations. And this is something that they said it didn't cost us any money. It was very easy to do. Um, so you could say, Alexa, make a, a gift to Fred Hutch, and it will do that. Um, there's so many applications of AI, they don't have to be difficult, you know, deep learning or machine learning applications. And it doesn't have to be robotics. It can be simple plug and play interfaces like this that will help organizations give additional opportunities for people to make gifts. Um, our team and what I shared, and I'll go through this very quickly, is that we filed the first patent to predict generosity using AI. Uh, we actually have two patents that just went into utility patent phase. Uh, which is really exciting on predicting individuals that are most likely to make a gift based on experiences. And this is what we're doing in, now in uh, religion and higher education and, um, and mostly in healthcare at this point is that people have certain experiences and based on those experiences, you can predict individuals that are most likely to give versus just looking at either everybody the same or everybody in just broad buckets. So, um, you know, cracking the code on gratitude, I'll, I'll fly through this part because I don't want to, um, I want to talk more about um, some decision making, is that our industry uses wealth screening as a, a primary way of finding prospects. While like qualification meetings and board um, uh, volunteers are highly effective, um, they're very difficult and expensive tools to qualify individuals. So we tend to follow wealth screening, um, which is about 78% of uh, organizations we surveyed use well screening as a primary way of finding prospects. Our belief, um, and I think most people's belief, is that it's not about wealth, it's about residence. People give because of how they feel or how they want to feel. They feel they give because they, um, they're inspired, they're engaged, or because they want to be. And this is where our industry needs to make a major pivot and also where AI, really for the first time in history, could you actually access this much data, but not only access it, but to compute it that quickly that individuals could, uh, or individual organizations could then suss out people that align with them. Um, lots of examples of, of this, and we see more of it in retargeting, um, in political campaigns for sure. Uh, Trump in the last election made insanely heavy use of this. Um, but I'm starting to see other organizations like ASPCA and some others that they don't just serve up the same ad um, when they're retargeting online. They're serving up an ad based on whether the characteristics of, of a donor that they know that uh, had adopted a cat or a dog. Um, they can now serve up um, ads about supporting ASP, ASP, ASPCA that are targeted to that person's kind of uh, bent on, on, in that case, animals. It can be done in every single sector um, and will be done in every single sector. And while we see that a lot in retargeting online and through in digital, uh, we're definitely seeing more of that in uh, obviously offline, but then in also just strategy of who is the best uh, prospect, but who's the best gift officer based on that prospect, uh, things like that. So really this transition, um, moving away in our industry from wealth and giving patterns to emotional experiences with wealth and giving patterns, all of that creates a more holistic view of an individual. And, um, and that's where our industry, if we do want to see a net increase in philanthropy and stop the decline that's been happening, it's going to have to be because of us using big data and, and AI tools to really hone in on individuals that resonate with us or ways that we can communicate 
in really customized ways that we can communicate with individuals that re re resonate with them individually. Uh, we, I'll just give an example of this in um, higher ed and in um, healthcare. But in higher ed, it's a lot of people uh, obviously an advancement in this is that you, we think about every alum kind of as a, a graduate. We, we, you know, whether we do well screening or not, we basically think that everyone who graduates is on an equal playing field. But we're really not taking into account that every alum, every graduate's experience is completely different. And the data exists to discover or basically um, decode an alum's experience because uh, everyone who graduates, uh, if an alum took five years to graduate, another one was accelerated and took three and a half, one lived on campus, another one didn't. Uh, one went to a lot of sporting events and pledged and another one who didn't. One had 12 parking tickets and the other one had none. The two alums' experience and their view of the university is going to be vastly different, yet today we look at all alum the same. We just say they're a graduate and they're going to get our communication, they're going to get our newsletter, or they're going to get some outreach along the way, and at a certain point, those that, you know, continue to engage will keep them kind of, you know, will elevate them or, or escalate kind of the activity with them, and those that don't kind of fall off. The reality is that we could find this information out very quickly um, up front, even before someone graduates. So, uh, and then monitor and the benefit of machine learning is that every activity, everything that alum does or doesn't do would be recalculated into the idea that they're an engaged uh, alum or not. So no more of having to go back 10, 15 years later and, and pretend that the, the undergrad experience that alum had wasn't as bad as they it, probably remember it is that starting out fresh knowing exactly which alum had those good experiences and really play to those experiences so uh, we just got a contract with a, a college in New York that we're doing this with and um, actually several others that we're talking with right now uh, and it's been really exciting to see uh, kind of the the eyes opening of like oh my gosh we have this data it's not easy to get but we have a lot of it and we can now look at these these populations. It's exactly what I'm talking about. No matter what sector anyone is in, arts, religion, higher ed, data exists that speaks to a person's engagement and it really honing in on that. So healthcare, we do this all day long, every day with our clients, but healthcare is based on a person's experience in a hospital. How many times were they seen? What doctors did they have? Was it inpatient? Was it outpatient? What is their satisfaction? Did they have did they fill out a survey and, and say that th this is the best place and they would recommend it to all their friends and neighbors? Or did they fill out a survey and said, this is horrible and I would never recommend? Uh, so lots and lots of data. All of this information goes back to data, big data, being able to compute it in a machine learning environment to basically serve up individuals that resonate with an organization. And this could go on and on and on. And as I wrap up here, um, really just as we think about how things are changing, organizations have to be really thoughtful about how they want to approach this. Um, and really even think about is AI the solution? There's a lot of times I'll tell uh, people that AI is not the solution. If you have five or, five or 10 or less than 18 data points, um, you have millions of records, but 18 data points, you don't need AI. You can use regression analysis just as well now today as it has ever been used. But if you get over 18 to 24 variables, in our case, we use hundreds, 100, and 100 to 150 variables, you can't do that um, in typical regression. You have to go to an AI solution. Machine learning ends up being extremely inefficient, uh, efficient and very good at doing this. Um, and the reality is understanding that people are complicated. People make decisions rationally and irrationally. So you'll never get to 100%, but can you get closer by gathering all the digital exhaust that a person had left behind an organization to determine, like, is this person that we could re-engage or we should engage with? Um, life is complicated. The digital exhaust is expansive. Um, I love having those creative conversations with organizations around starting with, well, we only have this data point and that data point, and then you start to whiteboard and realize there's a lot more data that you have that you 
uh, had thought of. It may not all be consistent. It may some be in Excel and some be in a CRM, um, but that's a great starting point. And frankly, where it comes down to is that if you end up, like I said, with 18 or 24 data points, fine. Anything more than that, which frankly everyone should have more than that, you have to go to an AI format and you should embrace it. You should go online, do a lot of research. You should talk to people that are good at this um, and, and uh, figure out how to apply it to your organization. Um, you know, just in terms of the donor experience, AI can really help personalize a, an experience with any organization to an individual. And when you even just Google this, um, you know, machine learning, natural language processing, there are 366 million answers to this. So um, the private sector is using this like crazy in the customer experience. Every, AI is everywhere all over the customer experience and it can be used the same way in the, the donor experience. And just the last couple of slides, and is, uh, we're just about out of time, um, really looking at what the use is for um, AI. Is it to gain efficiency? Is it to create personalization so that the donor experience is like, they wrote this for me? Um, that's really where we're going um, to as, uh, in technology. Um, and then also to uncover trends that wouldn't be apparent if you were just using a couple you know, data points are just looking at, you know, prior giving patterns. So, so really just evaluating, um, I already talked about the, the, um, the ethics part of it and the idea that there needs to be an ethical framework, but this is the reality is I see a lot of organizations try to bite off more than they can chew. You've got to start, you've got to be realistic. You've got to think of AI as a tool. We're very clear with our clients that AI is not a silver bullet, there's no panacea, that it's a tool, it's a great shortcut, um, but it's not a cure-all. So be clear about that. Getting started is key, and this is what I talked about earlier. Those that wait will have a diminishing return. Those that wait will be further and further behind. I, I, and this is not any kind of like my bias, this is just the truth of how AI and machine learning works, is that those that start now will have that much advantage in the future. Um, AI tools are coming out faster and better than they've ever been. Uh, so that part is really exciting. There is really opportunity loss in, in waiting uh, or you know, fixing to get ready. And the other thing is just trying to identify one problem and, and try to solve that first. I think organizations try to add two or three or four different problems like, well, let's solve this for a donor experience and also plan giving and also major giving. And that's where organizations just bite off more than they can chew. Um, it's much, much better, highly advised to pick one specific thing, get really good at answering that thing, and then move on from there. And it'll be much easier to apply whatever technology you create to other, uh, to other uh, answers. I also have some tips in here um, for you to just think about and um, kind of measure as you're thinking about AI in the future. Um, but I'll keep these in the slide deck for you. But um, whether it's good or bad, I'll, my last uh, comment here, I believe that AI that helps build closer relationships with donors is good. And simply, if the AI does not help foster closer relationships between uh, organizations and donors, then it's bad. It's as simple as that. If it brings you in closer relationship, a more trusted relationship, or identify people that resonate with you, um, it's good. But if it makes giving more transactional, if it um, automates giving in a way where it's just a, a transaction and there's no real deeper relationship, then it's bad. And um, there's some other thoughts here to be um, uh, discussed, but it really comes down to that relational side of things. So um, I think that's about it. We're gonna end where we started and really hopefully convince you that it's time to explore AI and um, those that don't are going to regret it in a very big way. Um, even though we're just at the forefront of this right now, now is the, the future. And uh, the hope is that with AI, we can inspire a net increase in philanthropy that would be something that's never been done before in the 2000 years since Aristotle uh, wrote his, his comment. So here's my information. Happy to be a resource for anyone who wants to think through things, has questions, uh, my phone number and my email address is there. 
and uh, look forward to engaging with other like-minded individuals um, and uh, appreciate all of your time. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. As Nathan mentioned, we will get the slides up for you on the Meeting of the Minds website. There will also be a recording of this session available. We have our final session coming up in just about 15 minutes here, which will be our discussion of responding to the coronavirus health cri crisis and different things that institutions are doing and suggestions that we have. Nathan, thank you so much for your expertise. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it.